Welcome everyone to this latest in a series of author events, which are a collaboration between New South Wales Public Libraries. It's wonderful to know there are library members from across the state joining us this evening. So sit back and relax. If you have a question for our author this evening, at any time, please feel free to add it to the Q&A box. It's down on the bottom of the screen and we'll get to audience questions at the end. And if you have any comments um, or anything you would like to write to Garth, uh, feel free to also type that in as a comment and we'll make sure this chat um, text goes to Garth at the end as well. Um, before we do get started, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land from which each of us are on. I pay my respects to the Aboriginal elders, past and present, and extend those respects to other First Nations peoples also. I celebrate the diversity and resilience of Aboriginal cultures and languages across Australia. Tonight, I'm on Bidjigal country, and I also work on the land of the Gaimaraga people. Wherever you are across the country, always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Now, my name is Yasmin Greenhouch and I work for Stanton Library at North Sydney Council. And it's my pleasure to introduce this longtime favourite Australian author, Garth Nix. Garth has been a novelist for 20 years, sold about 6 million books. 30, 30 years. 30, right. 30 years. Oh, how the time flies. <laughs> 30 years next year, actually. 30 years, 6 million books. More? Yeah, that's about something like that. Yeah. <laughs> and been translated into 42 different languages. I, that's it's still around, I think. It might be 43, but uh, that's good. close yeah. enough. Yeah. <laughs> and tonight we're celebrating his latest novel, The Left Handed Booksellers of London. Welcome, Garth. Welcome. Thank you very much. I would also like to acknowledge that here I'm on the land of the Gadigal people of the Aurora Nation, and I pay my respects to them and to elders past, present and future. Um, thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Yeah, this is a good one. Now, Garth, to start off, well, this wonderful book is ranking quite well on some bestseller lists, we've noted, which is a testament to its appeal and readability. As a librarian, I know that we can sometimes be swayed about choosing books for the library by a librarian character or title. So a cheeky question to start. You've worked as a bestseller before. How intentional was it? Booksellers in the title of your novel. Well, I'm sure it hasn't hurt. Let me let me put it that way. Um, it, it it certainly is part of the appeal to booksellers, and but it wasn't. It was never the primary purpose because I'm never driven by that by that sort of decision in the writing of anything. Because I always I always think of it as it's not it's not a left right brain sort of dichotomy, but it is certainly something where I always write the book I want to write. I write the story that I, I want to tell. Only when it's done do I try and figure out how best to to sell it and and how to market it and so on. Because I I have worked as a bookseller and publishing for many years at the same time as being a writer. So I'm deeply immersed in the business of books uh, as well as actually writing them. But I always keep the I've always kept them kind of separate. Um, and I've quite often written things, written books that were not immediately what publishers wanted. I mean, I mean, typically a publisher wants whatever worked last time. So a known quantity is always a good thing. So if you're writing a series like my Old Kingdom books, for example, publishers typically always just write more of those. Uh, but throughout my long career as it is now, I've always, I've always done whatever. The story that was strongest in my mind is the one that I've written, uh, even if it's not the, the most commercially obvious one at, at the time. So uh, to be honest, it didn't even really cross my mind when I, I started to think about this story. Um, in many ways, uh, as, as a friend of mine pointed out, the book is, is a love letter to bookshops and booksellers and to many of my favorite books growing up and to many, many other things. Um, and that's, that, that's, that was the overriding force behind it. But of course, writing a book that features booksellers as heroes and also booksellers as uh, you know, guardians of, of everybody else from the mythic underworld, as it were, it's not a bad thing. Uh, booksellers do like it. But I guess the other aspect of that is I also do what I, the other thing I always do is I write the kind of book I want to read myself. So I guess, you know, as a former bookseller once upon a time, it appealed to me and so it appeals to booksellers. But the primary motivation is, is always is that story strong in my head and I, I want to tell it and I want it to be the kind of story that I want to read. It's, it's always my, my strongest motivation. 
Ah, that's really excellent. I do have a kind of a similar question also waiting when you were saying about the book being a love letter to certain things. The novel itself is set in 1980s London and you visited London in the 80s. It involves or includes curiously precise descriptions of the types of guns and RAF helicopters and the like and you were in the Army Reserve when you were younger. Would you say that you've indulged yourself a few trips down memory lane in the writing? Oh, ab absolutely. I mean, part of that stuff is because if you kind of look at the DNA of the book, I mean, it's it's a fantasy thriller. So mm -hmm. it, is a, it is a fantasy. And the fantasy elements uh, are very much what I wanted to do is I wanted to take the sort of sensibility and feel of some of my favourite children's fantasies, uh, particularly, you know, Susan Cooper's The Dark is Rising, Alan Garner's The, Moon, uh, the, the Weird Son of Brisingerman and the, the Moon of Gomrath. Um, those books where the, the real world is underpinned by a mythic world and, and they, you can move between them and sometimes they merge somewhat and, and you know, entities come out of the, the, the mythical world into our contemporary world and people are drawn into the mythical world and so on. Which of course, in turn, is drawn, you know, is drawn very much from English folklore and fairy tales and myth. So I wanted to get that sort of sensibility, but I, I didn't want to write it as a children's fantasy, even though of course I do write children's fantasy as well. This time I wanted to, I wanted to take that sensibility, but I also wanted to meld it with with a thriller because I also love thrillers, and I wanted to sort of combine those two, which is which is what it is. It's a, it's a fantasy thrill, and of course, one of the things about uh, you know, thrillers or some of the conventions of thrillers, and I think it, it does help make them work, is that kind of detail about weapons and helicopters and equipment and, and so on. So I think, again, what I was trying to do is, again, replicate the kind of story that I wanted to read in a particular mix. So, and, and not one, it is done far more frequently now than it, than it was when I was growing up. Um, the other aspect of it being set in England in 1983, I mean, partly it's because it's because of wanting to draw on those, on that that English myth and legend and folk and fairy tale and those very influential children's stories. One of the reasons it's 1983 is because that's when I first went to the United Kingdom. I was 19, and one of the things I did when I was there is that I reread many of my favourite children's books in the places where they were set. So it's in the geography and the landscape that where that where they were set. So I read Alan Garner in Cheshire. I climbed Orderly Edge. Um, I read in other books, Swallows and Amazons in the Lake District. I read The Eagle of the Ninth on on uh, Hadrian's Wall. Uh, I read Dickens in London, and so it just seemed to make sense to me that this book, which draws a lot on that on that experience should take place in the early 80s. It was only much later, and it's actually, to be honest, was when people pointed out to me, it's easy to write a thriller where there are no mobile phones and no Google. Uh, it's actually very helpful. But that didn't, that didn't even occur to me at the time. I, I'd like to claim that I was very clever and thought, oh, I should put this in the past. But it just was instinct, really, that all of these things seem to point to, point to that time. And, of course, I also... Though I've been back to the United Kingdom many, many times since, uh, that, that first visit, uh, I spent the most time. And so uh, London in particular at that time is very strong in my memory and in my head. So I could draw upon that um, as well as having to you know, look things up and double check things and so on. Even though it is a slightly alternate 1983 because I wanted to I wanted to mess around with history a little bit and change the timeline a little bit because I wanted it to be a more equitable 1983. I wanted it to be more gender equal, more diverse. Uh, so not the actual 1983 in, in all respects. It is in most respects, but I wanted to change those things because yeah, why not? We had a uh, question come through as you were speaking then um, that also picked up on that, that the book was set in a slightly different 80s to our world. Yeah. So booksellers of not of our world, and they were wondering about the reason for those subtle changes to other things. Well, that's that's one of the reasons. I mean, I wanted to be able to to make it how the eighties should have been, perhaps you know, or, or to make. The, I I think there's 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 some ongoing conversations some with people who write fantasy sometimes that that you, you get these which to me seem quite ludicrous arguments. If you're writing a 
very strong in medieval fantasy, for example, you have to take all of the medi medieval history. So you have to take all the perceived gender roles, even though they've nearly always they've got the history wrong as well. I, I've never seen the sense in that. So you, you can have dragons, but you can't have women soldiers. It, it doesn't make sense. Of course, you should be able to change it and make it however you make it work. You do need to, I mean, writing fantasy, you need a, a bedrock of real stuff. Uh, you, you do need to lay a foundation of real things, but that still gives you a lot of leeway to, to, to move around and change other things. And you just have to make it work. You have to put the pieces together to, to make it work. Um, and uh, maintaining you know, terrible inequality is not something you necessarily need to do just because it was like that. Uh, yeah. in, you know, I'm, I'm writing a story about magical booksellers uh, protecting us from <laughs> a, mythic, you know, a mythic old world. I think you can do other, other changes as well. Yeah. And there's a delight in reading that as well. I noticed that after finishing my first reading of the book that all of the main, strong, competent characters in this one were women and most of the men were ineffectual or blundering or baddies. <laughs> well, uh, I wouldn't go also, that far. <laughs> it was it's a broad one, but it's, yeah, it very much seemed to be that. But also that the character of Merlin, and even when he was a likeable and capable main character and a love interest for Susan and all of that, Merlin is presented not only with the delightful focus on the importance of dress-ups, dress-ups are serious business, I believe, but also as a bit gender-bending. Can you tell us more about how he presented gender in this novel? Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, why. well, the booksellers, um, as Merlin says himself, um, when Susan first meets him, uh, uh, Susan is a, is 18 years old she's come to london to search for her father because she doesn't know she doesn't know who who he is she only has a few clues from her mother who's very absent-minded and rather dotty for you know people think it's from drug use in the 60s perhaps it is mm -hmm. um and so she's come to search for her father but one of the the clues that she follows almost immediately lands her uh in contact with merlin who is a left-handed bookseller and the left-handed booksellers are Kind of the field agents of of this secret society that that polices the old world, the mythic entities of the old world. Uh, the left-handed booksellers are the are the field agents, and the right-handed booksellers are kind of the controllers and researchers. Uh, though they do have their own magical powers as well. So she meets Merlin, and she's not immediately sure whether he's a, a young man or is a young woman just wearing a man's suit. Um, and that was the first part of the book that I wrote. There is a prologue, but I actually wrote that later. And, and put it in. Um, and the first few paragraphs of the book introduce Merlin and his clothes, which are very important. And it just seemed to be part of his character. I thought, well, is you know, is is Merlin is he male or is he female, or could he could he be whatever, you know, either or whatever he wants to be? And Merlin explains it himself. He says that all the booksellers are somewhat shapeshiftery, and they can they can choose their gender. Um, and in the same way, they, they can change between being left and right-handed and so on as well. And I think this, this not only fits in, you know, with contemporary ideas of, of gender, because that's changed a lot in, in, in recent times. And I think uh, that's another thing. That's another, that would be another good, if the world was, you, you were able to choose who, who you are and, and, and have your physical being reflect who you are. That, that would be that would be wonderful. Um, so why not put it in the book? But also it also connects with myth and legend and folk and fairy tales, where you know the folk of of, of fairy or of other realms often are, you know, their their gender is very unclear or it's unclear to, to mortals. So it all can it all connects on it connects on several different levels. Um it's on on a sort of contemporary, you know, social equality level um, but also into you know myths and, and legends of of uh you know being able to change gender and and, and so on and i just thought it just, it just felt right for the character so a, a lot of the things that i do are governed very much by instinct i find it quite difficult to explain them afterwards when when someone asks me like why did you do this i'm i think hmm, i don't know not really i have to try and invent, i have to try and think about why i did that um or uh, you know, work out the reason why I did that. Um, I just know that it seems to work and uh, and that's that's good. That's excellent, thank you. 
with the, I wish I had a more intellectual explanation. No, I'm sure the authors absolutely. would be able to, uh, would, would have a far better explanation for, for, for a question like that. No, I think it's fantastic to also just have that sense of this is this is possible, this is the way you can write it, this is how it flows for you, and that you've put in things like this in, with, I suppose, intentionality into the yeah. as well, rather than yeah. let it just be hinted at. It's actually there. In the well, story. also, yeah. I mean, there's always a sort of default setting. If you don't explicitly mention, mm -hmm. you know, people's gender or ethnicity or then the, the default for the majority of readers is that everyone is just a white Anglo-Saxon male, um, particularly if you talk about, uh, you know, in terms of gender, if you talk about the jobs and so on, and people just expect, if you mention a security guard, the expectation will be it'll be a male security guard. So you have to be explicit that it's not, or, uh, or a taxi driver or whatever, you know. So I think all, all those things. So, and many of these things I've had to learn over the years, I mean, uh, and I'm still learning, obviously, there's still many things to be informed about as a writer, because it's so easy just to not think about and just, just write without thinking about the impact upon, upon readers who are not the same as I am. Uh, so I've certainly benefited from, from discussions about you know, all, of, all of this. Um, and, and I'm sure you know, I have, there's, there's always room for, to do more and think about it more as well. Yeah, and definitely ways to um, balance between diversity, putting more diversity, intentional diversity into novels, but also balancing that against own voices as well. And yeah, absolutely. Yeah, finding yeah, well, stories that, that... Absolutely, that's another issue because you don't want to inhabit the voice of someone who is, is not you and take it away from them. You know, so there's, that's another, there's a whole appropriation uh, issue as as well. Yeah, I think you're doing well. Doing well. Thank so you. far, thank you. <laughs> it's just good to be. It's good to think of these things. Just yeah. being aware of them is is important. And continuing yeah. to have the conversations, like you say. Yeah. 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 Um, do you have a? Someone has sent in a, a pretty good standard question from uh, Kate. She said, "Hi, Garth. Who has been your favourite character to write?" And I'm going to throw on an extension to that question sure. and say, in this novel, who has been your favourite character to write? And if there was a minor character in this novel that you were um, to write as a main character in a future novel, which one would it be? Interesting. There's two interesting questions. Um, I don't actually have a favourite character. Um, and then to, to one degree, that's because it's like, you know, who's your favourite child? You can't possibly choose one. Um, but, but also, I just don't think of them in that way. Um, they all present, you know, all characters present sort of opportunities and challenges. Sometimes they're, they're the thing, sometimes they come easily, and sometimes it's, it's difficult. There's never any one character that's always just a pure pleasure to write and everything just flows. Uh, I wish that were so. Um, there's always di different challenges at different times. So I don't have a I don't have a favourite character. I don't have a favourite character in many of my books, uh, to be honest. Um, I you know I like I like them all, including very obscure secondary characters because they're all there for a purpose. They're all, they're all there as part of, of the story. They all do what what, what they need to do. Um, I guess some characters that I've spent more time writing about, I know more about them, but I'm not sure whether that makes them, pardon me, a favourite or or not. I just I just know more about them. Um, in terms of secondary characters who might spin off their own series, as it were, um, there's actually a, there's a lot in left-handed booksellers. Uh, there's quite a lot of people who could carry another story. Yes, um, fantastic minor characters in there. <laughs> thank you. Um, but I think that that sort of applies to again. I wouldn't pick one out. I mean, almost anyone. I think I could I could do something with. Uh, an, an editor, a friend of mine, once said that, uh, who's published quite a number of my short stories in different anthologies over the years. He said to me that all my short stories feel like they're part of bigger works, and I wasn't initially sure whether that was a negative comment. Um, but he said, no, no, it's positive because they still feel complete but they also feel like they're part of something larger. And that I like that myself. I mean, I like stories need to, to be complete in themselves and, 
and you know you feel like you've had you know you've been to the restaurant you've had a great meal but then there's this whole other menu you could have if you go back to the restaurant again um, and I always I like that in, in books I like to feel that they are part of a bigger story or more stories where you, you can you, you could go back and of course many authors do go back and I always I always do like that whether it's a long term series or whether it's connected books in the same world and and so on um so yeah i think almost everything i've ever written has the potential to be revisited for more um and, and some of them of course i do and, and others i have notes for it and maybe i will at some point in the future i you know i, I hope i hope so and you're not uh necess- you don't necessarily write your you know series or in linear order as well no no well that appeals to me as well i like the gaps between stories um and particularly you know particularly when you're writing something like the old kingdom series where there's a, a long history and there's there's lots of gaps between the stories that i've told and i like to be able to go back in and and you know, fill out, if, occupy one of those gaps, or or explore, you know, some some untold part of, of the story, whether it's back in time or it's ahead in time or it's just sideways. Um, that's something that, that also always appeals to me. Yeah. Um. You have worked as an editor before, am I correct? Yes. Oh yes, yes, yes. Oh, yeah. I was an editor. Do you think that's helped your work? Or the work of your editors, perhaps? Well, the work of my editors is certainly... Well, it just has me <laughs> being there to help them edit my work. Um, I was just going to say, I mean, editors are you know, very important in the, in the, the process of, of you know, getting the book as, to be as good as it can be. Um, you know, the right editor is a very important part of, of the process. I mean, one of the things... You know, I, I worked in publishing, you know, I was a bookseller, I was a sales rep, um, you know, I was a publicist, I was an editor, uh, I was a literary agent. Uh, you know, so I did lots and lots of different jobs in publishing. At the same time, I was always writing at the same time. Sometimes people think I did all my publishing jobs and then became a writer, but actually I was a writer first. I realised that I needed a day job very early on and I thought, oh, well, I'd like to work in books. So I was doing the two concurrently So I, I, I would, until I couldn't balance them anymore because of the demands of not actually the, so much the writing as the promotional part of writing um so you know i've been a full-time writer for the last 20 years um you know which is is very fortunate place to be not you know it's it's actually relatively rare most writers in fact continue with their day jobs as i did you know for my first dozen or so books um but i think one of the things about working in publishing is it, it certainly helps you understand why things happen and it also helps you make the best of it, it helps you inform your decisions it helps you to you know, make the best use of what you've written i was talking at the beginning of how you know i write what well, i always write what i want to write what i love but then i do also apply that other side of my mind very much to how can i make the best use of of this you know whether it's a book or a story or and uh, understanding the business is, is very important uh because there's many many pitfalls there's many there's many ways that that the business of writing can go wrong for an author. Uh, there's there's so many terrible ways things can cannot work out, uh, and sometimes it's just bad luck. But sometimes it's also about the choices, and also about the people that you work with. Uh, you know, teaming up with the, the best possible people in terms of your agent and and the people that publish your books. Uh, it's always about people. Uh, you know, sometimes authors get very excited about. Now working with a uh, one of the big five publishers, which is great, but actually the, the people you work with inside that publishing house are actually much more important than you know, the logo that's going to be on the on the spine of the book. Ultimately, um, so there's, there's there's all that, that publishing experience certainly helped me helps me understand things and make make the best of uh, make, try and make the best of things and understand when they don't work out as well. And as a aside to that, a question has come through from KG saying, what inspired you to write books? Well, I think what inspired me to write books was books. Um, <laughs> it was reading. I mean, it was, and, and I owe a huge debt to, since this is a library event, you know, I should acknowledge the huge debt that I owe the Canberra Public Library Service where I grew up. 
because my parents would read this. So, you know, a house full of books my parents read to me. Uh, I, I learned to read very young myself um, and I read voraciously. Um, I read so voraciously that I ran out of books. You know, my parents bought books, but I still ran out of books. Luckily for me, there was a specialist children's library, a very small one, basically in a shed, which was between my school and my home. So every afternoon I would, on the way I would walk home from school, I would stop at that little library uh, and I would get new books. I'd, uh, I would put my old books in, get new books. And they would also, because it was very small, it didn't actually have that many books, but of course it was part of the, the wider library service. So they would order in books for me. So I, I would often, they would give me my first Ursula Le Guin. Uh, so you know, I'd read A Wizard of Earthsea, then they'd get me to Terms of Actuan and so on. Um, I'd read A... Andre Norton, they get me all the rest. Um, so, you know, a great deal of my early reading, which is totally what made me want to be a writer, uh, you know, thanks to both the Canberra Public Library Service and also the libraries in my schools, which are very good. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's I, my first book, The Ragwitch, um, was completely my attempt to write the kind of children's fantasy that I like to read. Um, that, that's, and that's what's always driven me. I, and, but I owe it all to, to, to those books. I mean, even left-handed booksellers of London, uh, I would have read, I mean, The Dark is Rising by Susan Cooper. I would have got that from initially from that little library, you know, Connor in Canberra, um, and a big influence on this book. Uh, the Winston of Brisingerman, likewise. Uh, Red Moon, Black Mountain by Joy Chant also would have come from that library. Um, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's so many more. Um, and in fact, you know, one of the things that I've done for the last decade or, or more is I try, and, I, still, I try and buy the actual editions of the books that I borrowed from that library. So uh, even when I already have the books, I, if I spy one that is has the same cover and is the is the edition that I that I, that I would have read when I was ten or eleven. Um, I will I will try and add it to my my collection. So something wonderful about having yeah. that. that and and, and once I there. it is and once I actually bought, I saw I was in Canberra and there was the book fair and I saw a whole bunch of books which were the editions that I'd read and so I bought them. And I discovered that not only were the editions that I'd read, they probably were the actual books because they were from they were uh, from the Canberra Public Library Service that, that had been uh, been cancelled and, oh, and wow. put on sale. Treasures. So yeah, absolute <laughs> treasures. treasures. So from I thought, this is probably actually the book I read, but this is the actual book. So um, yeah, that's what that's what inspired me to write um, initially. Kind of like the book ancestors to this. And many yeah, other well, books in a way, aren't they? Ab absolutely, all, all my books. I mean, um, I mean, there's all kinds of other influences as well. Um, you know, I think almost everything I've ever read, you, you, know, you, you get something from it. Whether and it might even be, don't do this. You know, read read a book and it's like, mm, no, I, that that really didn't work. I must remember not to ever do that. Um, <laughs> so that you know, that works as well. Uh, but there's there's there's, there's some, some I think every book provide something and, uh, and uh, um, every author is, is an inheritor. The question has uh, come through from Ruth. Um, your stories do tend to be set in Eurocentric worlds, particularly England and the UK. Have you considered setting any of them in a more Australian world or is there a ten reason that you tend not to do this? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, basically... the influence of those early... Is, it is that influence, and it's partly partly that's just my age, um, and you know, growing up in late sixties and seventies, uh, you know, the preponderance of British books and American books, but there weren't actually that many Australian books, particularly for children. Um, and so I think there's there's that influence. Another influence is that uh, a great deal of of fantasy, actually across the English speaking world, so in America as well is very heavily derived from a tradition of English fantasy. I mean, not just written in English, but actually drawing on British folklore and so on. I mean, a lot of that's down to Tolkien, of course, and his massive influence, uh, but you know, many others as well. So I think that's part of it. The, the other aspect too, um, in my very first book, uh, The Rag, which is actually 
the parts that are in the contemporary world are set in Australia. Um, but even back then, I realised that part of the difficulty if you're a fantasist is that while, you know, while I live here and exist here, the folklore and legend of the country is not mine. It's actually the Aboriginal peoples. And so even I did do it in the rag, which without actually being explicit that it was Australia, but um, it does begin on a, on actually on a midden on the New South Wales south coast. Um, and, and later I realised that there, you know, there are big problems of appropriation. Uh, so I think it's, it's very hard to do. Um, and people who've done it in the past, um, and, and typically no one, no one really has done very much of this in, in recent times. So some urban fantasy you know, set in Australia, but, but again, the fantastical elements tend to be uh, you know, European ones, uh, almost invariably. Um, I think it's, it, it's, a very, it's a very difficult area. Um, and my natural strength just seems to be to write in a tradition that is mostly, mostly been uh, explored and, and mapped out by, by British and European authors and Americans writing in the same tradition. Because uh, I'd include people like, you know, also Robin McKinley is another big influence. Um, so, uh, and Ursula Le Guin, another, another huge influence. Um, you know, the, the, there's so many. So I think, I think that that's, if I wanted to write a story set in Australia, I, I would find it difficult to do, to write a fantasy story uh, without encountering those problems of, of taking something that isn't mine. And, and is also... Old magic, yeah, old was, magic. It, yeah, and is and is very crazy. much alive as well. I mean, it's it's not it's not just seen as a prose tradition in the same way that English folklore is. You know, it's it's it, 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 that's that's why I think. Yeah. Um. Another question that has come through. Uh, Jeannie appears. Lets you choose any book or series written by any other author to have your name appear as their writer. Which book or series do you choose? Well, I'm going I, to assume that there's no repercussions from doing this as well. I just wouldn't do it. <laughs> magical I, I still wouldn't do it. I mean, there's, there's so many books and series that I admire enormously, but if I hadn't written it, I wouldn't want my name on it. I mean, it's just, it's, uh, it's, I just don't, I can't, I can't even think in that way uh, because you haven't written it. It's, it's not, I mean, that's talking about acts of appropriation. Um, yeah. But there's, but there's, but there's, no, there's, there's many, there's many books and series that, um, that you know, I, I admire enormously, and I love to read, and, um, and do you have I'm glad a, they exist. a writing process or approach that you like to use for your books? Uh, yeah, I mean, everyone, I think, you know, you develop particular approaches and processes. I mean, everyone does, and uh, mine has remained relatively the same for. You know, 30 plus years, 34, 35 years now, I guess, of active writing. Um, or actually about 38 years now, I think about it, since I, uh, I did actively start writing at uh, 19. Um, I, I guess the, it does change a bit. Now, I'm always a bit cautious about talking about processes. I mean, people are always very interested in them, but often it's because they hope that that uh, they'll hear, you know, they, if they use the process, that will, that will, that's just the way to write a book. But there's so many different ways people write books uh, and stories, and there's no one right way to do it. There's no one. This is the best method ever, and it will work for everybody. You know, everyone does things in different ways. Um, the, I mean, the way I typically work for a book, uh, for a novel as opposed to a story, um, is that something will, something will spark off. Beginnings of an idea, and and books, you know, novels have lots of ideas. It's hardly ever just one idea. Uh, it's a con it's a conglomeration of lots of ideas. Some may be big, some may be small. So I'll get a I'll get some I'll get a spark. Um, and for example, the Left Handed Booksellers of London is one of my few books where I can actually point my finger directly at it and say I know where the spark happened. Um, I mean, it, it ignited the fuel laid by decades of reading and all my visits to the UK and you know, all that stuff, which was there in my mind. 
but I was in Edinburgh. Uh, I was on a book tour for my book Golden Hand, and I was signing books in uh, Waterstones in Leith, the port part of Edinburgh. Edinburgh, and I noticed that the bookseller who was helping me was left-handed, and I may have been left-handed myself because I I can write my left hand. But again, I'm of an age where I would not have been allowed to do so when I was at school. You weren't allowed to be left-handed. So maybe it was forced out of me. I don't actually remember. But I can still write perfectly well with my left hand. Um, and so I've always been interested in being left-handed. One of my sons is left-handed. And so I, I said to him, oh, you're, you're left-handed, just making a conversation as I'm signing books. And he said, yes, we all are. Everyone in the bookshop is left-handed. And I went, oh. Okay, wow, that's, that's interesting. And then he said, you know, and I think there's more left-handed people in bookshops than anywhere else. It seems to bookshops attract left-handed people. And I said, okay, right. So, you know, all of you, you're the left-handed booksellers of Lee. And then he said, yeah, you know, we are. And I, and, I, and I said, oh, there's a story in that. And I made a little note and I thought about it for some time. And that's, that's typically what happens is that something will spark like that where it's the, the beginning of an idea and then i thought about it for quite some time and often i will let something move around in my head for it might be a year or several years in this case it was about about a year and it's sort of coming together and in the, in that time it went from being the left-handed booksellers of leith to being the left-handed booksellers of london partly because i needed a bigger canvas I also know London much better, or bits of London, of course, it's a huge city. Um, so I've been quite a few times to leave. Um, and the, the, the basic ideas began to come together. It, wouldn't, it really would be about booksellers, and they it would be a fantasy where the left-handed booksellers had, 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 you know, were, were fighting booksellers. And I thought, well, what about the right-handed booksellers? And, and it all coalesced from there. And then normally when I've, I've got that idea, I've thought about it for quite some time, I, I make some notes and they're often just little uh, you know, minor details, there might be some character notes. Uh, and then I normally write, a, I write something and often it ends up being the prologue or it may be the first chapter or it may be a key sequence uh, later in the book or in fact, I may never use it in the book at all. But it's, it's like a little trial where I work out the tone and the feel of the book. And, and that often tells me you know, what, what it's going to be. Is, is it a children's novel? Is it a YA slash adult novel, a crossover novel? Is it a short story? Because it's all, I write it and I write the sample and then it's all there. It's like, oh, it's not a novel. It's, it's just a story. Um, and so in this case, I wrote the first chapter where, where Susan meets, meets Merlin. And, and then from there, what I normally do is I write a chapter outline where I write a paragraph for each chapter saying what happens, uh, except for that my chapter outlines never actually, I never follow them. They bear no resemblance to my finished books as a rule. If you look at one of my chapter outlines and then look at the book, you'd be like, what's going on? Um, and then- It's still part of the process. It's right? part of the process. And then <laughs> usually I will also write, um, only, only for the purposes of actually selling the book to a publisher, I'll write a, a short outline of two or three pages, like a, like a film treatment, which just says what happens. Um, and, and actually, I'm, I don't normally follow those either. So the publishers forgive you. They, they'll, they'll forgive you if, if, you know, a year later, they actually get the manuscript in it and it works. They won't even look at the outline. So, you know, it's just to, it's just to, uh, to, to sell the book to them at that point. Um, and then I just sit down and I, I typically, I pretty much write from beginning to end. Um, and, Many of my earlier books uh, I wrote when I had very busy full-time jobs in publishing mostly, though I did have some time I spent doing other things, um, where I just I would write a couple of evenings a week and I would write on Sunday afternoons. And if you do like two hours on Tuesday night, two hours Thursday night, five hours Sunday afternoon, in a year or a year and a half, you can write a book. Um, and since I've been a full-time writer, I I tend to... You know, I, I have a separate office. I've been very lucky that I have a separate office I go to. I've had a couple of different ones. And I spend probably a couple of hours doing some admin and bureaucracy because, uh, you know, you're a small business as well as once you've got a lot of books and they're published all over the place, uh, it's, it's, it's a small business that needs attention. 
and there's all the marketing and so on. Um, I do that in the mornings and then I start writing usually sort of late morning and then I, I end up probably writing three or four hours a day. Um, and then as the momentum increases, particularly towards the end of the book, I start writing again at night as well. Um, and quite often I'll do two or three hours at night. And I usually write the last, I write the last third of the book in about 10% of the time, the overall time. It all, it all comes rushing along if, if things are going well. And Nothing I just, motivates I, like a deadline. <laughs> yeah, no, I just keep writing more and more, but it's, it's, just, it's just the energy of the book uh, gathers and, and carries me forward. So, um, yeah, that's, that's, um, that's, in a nutshell, is, is my, mm. my, my, my process. But some people will begin at, the, begin at the end and work backwards. Some write key scenes and join them together. Some don't outline at all. Some people outline very comprehensively and then follow it rigorously. There's, there's everything in between. Have you been in touch with the left-handed booksellers of Leaf? To that? Well, I, I acknowledged did Stephen. Was the, I acknowledged Stephen in the in the in the acknowledgements, oh. and they they did. We had a little exchange on on Twitter. Yeah. Oh, so, I'm glad. To um, hear. Oh yeah. It's, <laughs> you know, it was. It was um, you know, bookshops are great places to get ideas, as are libraries. Um, you know, peaceful places of uh, contemplation, full of books. Uh, you know, they're bound to bound to get more ideas for more books in them. And a chance across something like that. It's been uh, a quite a year for a lot of folks, and many people seem to be reading more than ever. We feel it in the libraries. I imagine they feel it in the bookshops as well. Um, so some people read, obviously, for pleasure and comfort and escapism, especially in this particular year. And a lot of people have been reading lots more to help make sense of the world, you know, with the help of fiction and nonfiction. How has your reading been this year? Has it changed? Are there any highlights? It's an interesting question. I've always, I always read a lot. I read nonfiction as well as fiction. Uh, it has been a very troublesome year. I, you know, I mean, I've been lucky. I think you know, most of us, are, in, in terms of the world, we're relatively lucky to be here in Australia and, and so on. Um, but I think I actually have been doing more comfort reading I think I have read, I have been doing more reading of books that I find comforting that remove me from thinking about the state of the world and the future and so on, as opposed to ones that make me think about it. Mm. Uh, because, so I've read less, I've probably read less history and politics, which is two things I, I often read about. Um, and I've also probably read we read more historical novels too. So looking back into the past. So even when it's a troubled past, it's still preferable to the, the, the current, the present, uh, our troubled present because it's ours. At least, the, at least the troubled history is it's gone. It's you know, and 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 we we got through it. Um, so yeah, um, I, I do think I've been I've been doing more uh, more reading for for escape and comfort than. I mean, I'm always doing that, but I've done even more than I usually do, I would say. <laughs> and your book fits uh, very well into that as well. Like yeah. it's, it's worked as a wonderful journey away from it right in front of us at the moment. Yeah. I hope so. I, I, I hope so. And, and people have, have said that to me, that they've found it a, they've, they have found it a refuge. So that's good. I'm, I'm always very pleased to hear that. The um, What writing project are you working on now? This is a Rebecca... Uh, Sorry, a question that's come through from Rebecca. Sure. Yeah. Um, is it a sequel to the booksellers or something else entirely? Uh, well, at the moment, I'm writing another Old Kingdom novel, uh, which is called uh, Tercial and Eleanor, uh, which is Tercial is Sabriel's father. Um, so that that title, Tercial and Eleanor, probably gives it all away in a, in, a, in an instant. Um, but it is about Sabriel's parents. Uh, I'm behind schedule with it, um, so. Uh, I should have finished it already. I haven't, um, and but hopefully it will still be out late next year. It might, it might be early the year after if I, if I can't pull my socks up, and and actually manage to to get it done. Um, like like many, uh, you know, writers and artists this year, I've been, I have I have struggled at various times to, to uh, find my way. So with, with this work, uh, as I think every, everyone has trouble doing everything. Um, but yes, all being well, it will be, uh, it will be out 
late late uh, next year. Jersey and Ellen all. But I do have an idea for a sequel. I have notes for a sequel. I have notes for sequels to everything. I do have notes for for a follow up to uh, for left handed books all of London as well. So oh. we'll see. Yeah. We'll keep our eyes peeled. Yeah, please, <laughs> please do for all of them. Whatever, whatever I do, hopefully you'll keep your eyes peeled. Yeah. yeah. Um, another question that's come through um, from Nick: Given the recent adaptations of popular children's YA books, such as Artemis Fowl and Wrinkle in Time, into movies, that many of the fans of the books were unhappy with. Do you have reservations or concerns about any of your works being adapted into TV series or movies? Or is there any studios and producers you'd love to work with? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, you know, various times uh, I've been very involved with uh, the books being set up for various screen adaptations. I mean, at the moment, uh, Frog Kiss is in development with Disney. Uh, I'm fairly removed from that. I don't. I don't actually have much to, to do with, with that. I mean, it's a conscious decision. You really, there's only so much time and energy you can apply to being involved in, in screen adaptations because they do take an enormous amount of time and, and energy. And so I basically made the decision, you know, some projects I'll try and be more involved with than others. Uh, and it, it depends to a degree on, you know, who, who you're working with as well. Um, Frog Kiss is in development with, it was with Fox, um, and then when Disney bought Fox, they actually continued, they re-optioned it and continued to develop it, which was which was good. Um, but I actually have, you know, that one, who knows what what will happen. They do have a script. Um, I haven't actually seen it. Uh, there was any not, timeline for anything like that? No, there was never a timeline. I mean, they've, <laughs> they've, got, they've got some composers attached. I mean, they want to do it as a musical, animated musical. Um, It'll either be fantastic or or not. Um, but the people that I'm working with there are, are very good. Um, so, you know, fingers crossed. Uh, the Keys to the Kingdom is also in development uh, with another American company. Um, I do have more involvement with that and probably will we'll have more involvement going forward. Um, the Old Kingdom books um, have been set up different times or different places, most recently three years ago with Amazon as a, as a limited series. Um, I actually wrote the pilot for that with my friend Felicity Packard, who's a very experienced screenwriter, has written lots of, uh, lots of Australian television, um, so, which, was, which was, a, um, was great. And uh, so I had a lot to do with that, uh, but Amazon ultimately didn't pick it up. They, didn't, they decided not to make it uh, once after the pilot, uh, the classic. Hollywood, you know, we love it, we love it, we love it. Sudden silence, uh, <laughs> but, you know, um, and and actually, a change of personnel is the other aspect of that. The people we've been dealing with are suddenly all gone overnight. Um, but but that's, you know, I'm used to that. Um, I've done the rounds of the Hollywood studios uh, at different times, which has been very interesting and, and fun, you know, pitching different projects with different groups of people. I mean, my, basically what I've always tried to do is um, is when people come to me they're wanting to option the books or, or wanting to you know, buy the rights is to look at the people involved, not just the companies behind them. So it doesn't matter how big the company is or how much money they've got. Um, except, of course, they have to have enough to be able to make it. Um, That's similar to your theory on the publishing houses as well. Yeah, it's, it's all about the people. You know, it's all about the people. Um, and then but the problem is, of course, that once you do actually enter into a deal, particularly with a, a big studio or, you know, one of the big streamers, uh, you know, once you actually sign on the dotted line and you take their money, they do control it. So... Uh, no matter what it says about how involved you are, will be in doing various aspects of it. If they don't want you to be, you won't be. And so that is that's a that and is a reality. Out to the world. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's 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 always a um, it's a gamble. Um, I always just think pick good people, hope that they will be able to stay there and carry it through. Um, and sometimes they they aren't, and and they they fall by the wayside, or they turn out to be not the people you thought they were um, but you, you either it's one of those things where i could i could write books and i, I worked this out about 10 years ago after i'd, I'd been in, I'd doing the rounds in hollywood but uh, it took me i was there for a month 
um, you know, doing, I was working with some very good people, uh, but it probably took, it was a month actually there, there was a month getting ready beforehand, there was a month recovering afterwards. I could either write books, you know, I, or, or I could try and be involved in aspects of getting things made for screen. You, you can't, I couldn't do both, or I had to choose very carefully because, you know, time just, just dissipates. Um, so um, I just try, yeah, try and work with good people. Um, I, have a, you know, I have a very good film TV agent in LA to protect me on the business end um, and hope for the best. But you, you can't make things happen. And I, and I don't want to be, you can, you can try, you can't make things happen. You can perhaps, you can maybe adjust the percentages a little tiny bit uh, if you actually go and go and do all the stuff and you, you work at it all the time. But uh, it, I'd rather write books. So I, I figured I've got to focus on the writing and and not and not be too not over involved in, in that side of things. But you so who who knows? I mean, and the um, writing of the books is the bit that you do very well. So. That's the part that I like the best. So, and I also like writing. I do like writing for film. You know, I like writing for film and TV as well. But um, you know, I like to know. There's there's always the, the danger. There's lots of different inputs in that. Writing a book, you get to do by yourself and you make all the decisions, essentially. And yes, editors will help you, but it's ultimately, it's always the author who decides that, what it will be. And that's not the case with, with writing for film and television or with adaptations. So it's just, it's a different, it's a different part of that, of the, the craft of writing. And it's one that you have to be much more collaborative and uh, it has, you know, its appeal, um, but it takes a lot of time and energy and you've got to work out what to do so it doesn't mean I, I won't stick my, my foot in again and if, if the right opportunities you know, come up but uh, somehow I have to weigh up carefully. And the uh, pragmat that pragmatic attitude of yours uh, I think it kind of answers this next question but we'll ask as well from Lauren how do you deal with the negative uh, responses to your work and how much or how little does that inform your subsequent writing and editing processes? It's a good question um, because, and it, it 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 is something that that um, can be very can be difficult. Um, I think with both negative and positive responses, you have to not let either of them affect you too much. And it, it's easy to say, but it's it's hard to do. Uh, one one method is to never read any reviews. Um, I, I have author friends who actually just never read any reviews whatsoever. Uh, but that also typically means not being on social media, so they don't copy any of those comments either, and so on. And that works. That works for them. Um, I actually do read reviews. I mean, I don't. I don't read um, sort of widespread, you know, opinions on on Goodreads or whatever, because there's too many. But I do read reviews. Um, not not always, but you know, I, I don't actively not read them. Um, I think the thing I learned early on. I guess from being in the business is that there's nothing you can do once the book is out there. Whether if it's getting negative reviews, you, there's nothing you can do for those those readers it doesn't connect with. So you have to let it go. And some books do better than others. I'm not talking my own books. You know, some are received better than others. You always hope they'll be well received. And I've been very lucky that generally all my books are well received, and some of them are very very well received. And and loved even, which is which is fantastic. But again, you can't make that happen. It's the book goes out. It is like an adult child's gone off on its life, and you know sometimes you wish that people would like that adult that that creation of yours would like it more. Um, but you, you can't make it happen. Um, so I do try and separate myself from the negative aspects, but also you don't want to get too carried away with the positive stuff either. Um, and I do seem to have always been able to insulate myself from, from uh, you know, opinions about my work, um, because ultimately, uh, you know, you, you are left alone to write it. Um, I, I listen very carefully to my editors and I, I, there's always things that I do that editors suggest and, and, and sometimes they've been incredibly important. But once it's actually out there, um, I just I just want to move on. It's like I can't do anything about that now. That, that book is it is what it is, and it's going to do whatever it's going to do. 
all I can all I can control is my next book, and I will try and write that. And I t- I don't I guess I don't really think about I don't think about anyone's opinion when I'm writing the next thing or my current thing. I just think about sounds very self-involved. I just think about myself and and what I want in the book, and and quite often what I want in the book, you know, I, I, if I I don't get there initially. Quite often, you know, I, I write something and it's not what I want it to be. And if someone else was reviewing it, they would be negative about it. But I'm negative first and then I fix it up. <laughs> and so, you know, I revise it to until it is what I want it to be. So, you know, revision is a very important part of, of what I do and what nearly, I mean, I don't believe any writer who claims they don't revise. I have met a few over the times, but I don't, really, I don't really believe them. Um, but I revise, I revise massively, and some some books need, you know, so much revision to get them to the state where I'm happy with them, and then they, you know, they get more editorial advice, they get more revision, and then they go out in the world, and then whatever happens happens. And I know that you're writing for yourself, but there are obviously a lot of people out there that are loving your books, and I'm mindful that we're running out of time, so I'm going to. Let everyone know if you want to write any comments for Garth in the chat. We're going to pass this chat on to him afterwards, so feel free to. Um, but I also just wanted to finish with a question quickly from, I've only got a couple of minutes, from Elizabeth, age nine. Hi, Garth. Is there going to be another Frog Kisser book? I really oh. loved it, and Ardent is my favourite character. Thanks, Elizabeth. Oh, well, thank you, Elizabeth. That's a very good question. Um, I like all my other books. I have notes for another frog kisser book, uh, which I would like to write. I just don't know. I don't know when. Um, and uh, Ardent is. I love all my characters, but perhaps my dog characters are some of my most loved because uh, I do love dogs. So I'm glad to hear that that Ardent is is a favourite character. Oh, thank you. That's a lovely note to end on. Um, so thank you. We're all out of time now. Thank you so much, Garth, for being thank with us this evening. Yeah, for your thank conversation you and for your books, of course. Well, thank you. And thank you. Thanks, everyone, for reading and, uh, and for joining in today. Thank you, New South Wales Public Libraries. <laughs> Hi. Thank you very much. Right. Good night, Thanks, everyone. Yasmin. See Take you care, again. everyone. Bye bye.